This is the fourth time the World Affairs Council is hosting a German ambassador in the last seven years, which I think breaks down to about having um, the ambassador visit Charlotte every 18 to 24 months. So I will use the beginning of my little introduction to invite Ambassador Huber, if she likes Charlotte, which I hope she will, to come back again and to come back soon. It is an incredible pleasure for us to have the governor of the great state of North Carolina, Leroy Cooper, with us today, and he will say a couple of words. LJ, thank you for that introduction and for your leadership with the World Affairs Council. Also grateful to the North Carolina uh, Zeitgeist Foundation. If ever, ever, there was a time for work on international cooperation and collaboration, it is now. Also want to acknowledge the honorary consuls who are here that I've met earlier. Grateful for their work uh, with these countries that often provide good paying jobs to North Carolinians. And I'm honored to be here in Charlotte. When I speak to leaders across our country and across the world, I always tell them one thing, North Carolina is open for business. Our state's business climate helps companies of all sizes to grow and thrive. We're competitive on so many levels. Exceptional quality of life, the culture of innovation and entrepreneurship, the low cost of doing business, the ideal location here on the eastern seaboard, Infrastructure advantages like Charlotte Douglas International Airport, one of the best airports in the world. But I think there is one thing that sets our state apart above all others, and that is talent. Our people, our workforce. Our state has people who can help businesses achieve their goals. And the reason for that is that we are the home of top-tier universities, top-ranked business schools, and one of the best, if not the best, community college systems in the country. We have President Dietmeyer here from Central Piedmont Community College and new Representative Christy Clark, who's going to work to keep those community colleges strong. They help. Six, these companies succeed in everything from aviation to manufacturing. And our workforce system connects our NC works and our train workers with businesses. And we're grateful for that. We've had many successful German firms to locate in North Carolina and they already know the advantages of being here. German companies have 735 work sites in our state, as well as over 33,000 employees. Siemens Energy has enjoyed doing business in the Charlotte area for years, and our state has built a lasting relationship with the company. I've enjoyed touring the plant, seeing the good paying jobs that they've created, and they have put forth a great apprenticeship program because we know work-based learning is critical. Today, students start their apprenticeships sometimes in high school or at the community college, and with the combination of education and the work-based learning at Siemens, they get a great paying job Siemens gets a great worker. We also have a strong relationship with Daimler, which employs thousands of hardworking North Carolinians. I've been at their facility in Cleveland County, North Carolina, just a few months ago. They have access to one of the largest manufacturing workforces in the Southeast, and they are succeeding. And just last month, I was proud to announce that ITM selected Catawba County, Hickory, as the first North American manufacturing facility for that German company. 
They had countless options from across the world, and they chose North Carolina. And one reason for that, and I think the main reason for that, is the workforce. I am so grateful today to be here with the ambassador, Ambassador Emily Haber, spending some time with her this morning talking about North Carolina and our relationship, not only with the German companies that are here, but with the people of the Republic of Germany itself. We are grateful for that relationship, Ambassador. We're honored with your attendance today. We look forward to continuing to cultivate our relationship and the jobs that are created along with the import-export market. I have with me today uh, my Deputy Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, Kevin Monroe. Kevin, if you can wave your hand back there. Uh, all of uh, many businesses in the Charlotte area know Kevin, and you know if you have any state problem at all, just call Kevin and he can solve it for you. <laughs> but we are, we are grateful for this opportunity to showcase our state on the world stage. We are open for business. We are ready to move forward. I have a CEO mission statement for our state, and you CEOs know how important it is to set a goal. That goal, that mission statement is this. I want a North Carolina where people are better educated, where they are healthier, where they have more money in their pockets, and they have the opportunities to live more abundant and purposeful lives. That is it. The third grade class I told that to a few months ago really liked the more money in your pockets part <laughs> of the mission statement. But we do want a more prosperous North Carolina. And it begins with education from cradle to career, making that workforce that you need. The reason I'm leaving early is because I'm headed to Parkside Elementary School to talk to them about the need for a school construction bond in North Carolina and about increasing and improving the educational facilities that we have in this state. I look forward to working with you. It's always great to be in the Queen City. Thank you for this relationship and thank you for the work you continue to do. Dear fellow honorary consuls, Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm very pleased to be here. I have the pleasure and the privilege of being the German Honorary Consul. I very much appreciate that opportunity to be here today. Uh, in my function as uh, chairman of the North Carolina Zeitgeist Foundation, I would like to extend a special thank you to L.J. Stamberg, who has, as always, been a very, very good partner, very efficient partner here. And uh, congratulations to that huge turnout. LJ, you have done a wonderful job here. Um, allow me a couple of remarks to put the big event of today in proper context. Uh, this wonderful and friendly and beautiful region has been very good to Germans for a long time, for actually more than 270 years, actually longer than the existence of Charlotte itself, which has the honor of celebrating its 250th birthday these days. Actually, the, there was a first German, I don't want to say invasion, but people liked this here so much that they came here in the 1750s and 1800. Um, but that was followed by a second wave and more industrial uh, influx of German Germans here. They found that this was an ideal area to establish trade, commerce, and business here, and not only with big companies, but also with the famous Mittelstand, which is the, the backbone of the German industry. And thus, it has become a tradition that the most important representative of our country visits Charlotte, the most important representative of our country in the United States visits Charlotte for two reasons. Number one, to learn more about what is going on in Charlotte and the region. And secondly, to let us know what's going on in Washington what concerns the German-American uh, relationships. And as you all know, there's plenty to talk about. We had thus the honor and the privilege to welcome former ambassadors 
uh, over the past 30, 35 years. And it's a special pleasure to continue this highly esteemed tradition today by welcoming Ambassador Emily Harbour. Thank you very much. Mr. Stambuk, Mr. Cooper, ladies and gentlemen, such a pleasure to be here in Charlotte. I arrived early in the morning and I already had the pleasure to meet with the governor right before this event and I'm very grateful to the governor, governor for having made himself available. Frankly, it couldn't have been a warmer welcome here in Charlotte. Contrary to what some of you might expect, this is not the first time that I am in North Carolina. I've been here, albeit not in Charlotte, a few years ago. Well, it was back in 1969. I was a kid, and my family lived in Washington. In that summer of 1969, my father didn't have a holiday, but he wanted us, his children, to have a holiday. And he sent my brother to Camp Moorhead by the Sea in North Carolina. And he took me along uh, on the drive all the way from Washington. He wanted us to see the country. I have only hazy recollections of that trip. A series of images printed my memory like pictures taken. Long and straight roads in the blazing sun, the camp by the seaside, a policeman stopping my father for driving too fast, <laughs> admonishing him, but taking no action. He was friendly throughout the encounter, which, for the child that I was at the time, would forever connect kindness with people in North Carolina. When I landed on the airport today, I was fast forwarded into a different rhythm of life. What I got to see was one of the largest urban regions in the US, a real draw for business and industry. I felt reminded of the Ruhr Valley in more than one aspect. Some of you may still associate the Ruhr Valley with a region hit by structural crisis and the death of industries, but that was a different era too. Today, it's one of Germany's largest urban areas connecting several large cities in North Rhine-Westphalia. Its story is that the combination of infrastructure, connectivity, and concentration of business allows companies to thrive, similar to North Carolina. German businesses, it has been mentioned already, uh, in Charlotte and in North Carolina speaks for itself. The governor has mentioned the numbers, 230 German companies having created 33,000 jobs in North Carolina. It's the second largest foreign employer in the state, and that's a massive footprint. And it is why I was advised to come here and to see it firsthand. I visit several uh, companies, including this afternoon Siemens, a large gas turbine facility. But frankly, I do not want to focus solely on what companies have taken interest in so far. When I went to see the state's senators in Washington, Senator Burr and Senator Tillis, both advised me to take a look at the incredible capacity for innovation and research actually making, they said, the research triangle a Silicon Valley of the South. It would give me beyond the insight into the existing close economic ties between North Carolina and Germany a notion of the future potential for new cooperation, and this is what I will do, even though there's a lot I will not be able to see this time. And I'm grateful to the World Affairs Council in Charlotte for inviting me here today. I know of the huge reputation it enjoys when in the area it's practically impossible not to pay a visit to the council. And I would like to commend our hosts for the great work and the leadership. I would also thank the, like to thank the Zeitgeist uh, uh, Foundation and our honorary council, Klaus Becker, for their dedication to promoting German-American relations. Being here with you in North Carolina gives me an opportunity to take stock of our relations outside the Washington bubble, 
and to see for myself and to listen and to understand opportunities and challenges and arguments and vantage points. This goes both ways, of course. The Council obviously takes an interest in views and arguments from within the Beltway, as well as providing a fulcrum against which to gauge Beltway mainstreams. Which brings me to German-American relations. Today, invariably, people say to me when they meet me, these are interesting times, or they say these are challenging times. Both descriptions are a dog whistle for skepticism, charitably speaking. Now, let me put things into perspective. It's true that we do disagree on a number of issues, to name just a few. On Iran, Germans and Europeans want to keep Iran in the JCPOA, in the Iran Agreement, because we want to prevent Iran from res resuming its nuclear program. The US views a view is that Iran's malign behavior in the region, the missile program, and the sunset clauses are much graver risks and require withdrawal from the agreement. On NATO, the US uh, insists on more burden sharing and points rightly to the commitment undertaken by NATO member states to spend 2% of their budgets on defense. Germany agrees in principle but says that our defense budget will have grown by 80% until 2024, and more and faster expenditure in this short time frame would simply not be doable. We accept and stand by the 2% ob objective. We have changed our course accordingly, but it's a household truth that defense spending and modernization need time. On Nord Stream 2, the US thinks that the gas pipeline makes Germany hostage to Russia, whereas we argue that energy security is not defined by where the gas comes from, but whether it's re replaceable, which given the massive restructuring of the European gas pipeline since 2011 is the case. Today, one can pump gas in practically, into practically every direction you wish, north, south, east, west. And on trade, the U.S. criticizes the large trade surplus of Europe, that is, of Germany in particular. Germans and Europeans, on the other hand, point out that there is a U.S. trade deficit in goods, but certainly not in services, especially web-based services where the U.S. enjoy huge advantages and we are a big importer. Now, I could go on listing areas of disagreement, but I won't. The cases mentioned are sufficient for the point I wish to argue. While obviously much more could have been said about each of them, you will have noted that I sketched the contrasting arguments, the US and the German ones. I take the view that in international politics, among friends and partners, and whether you agree or not, you can usually expect your partner to have a very good reason for wanting what he wants. Just as I do see the US point on Iran and on Nord Stream and on burden sharing and on trade. The United States has national interests. Germany has national interests too. And the European Union has interests that are ex existential for the member states. And when we disagree, we want our arguments to be heard and respected or opposed by counter-arguments. And yes, even in those cases where the United States has the power to determine the course. I have mentioned that trade is one of the issues we currently disagree on. Let me expand a bit on this topic as it's probably relevant for most of you. The EU-US economic relationship is probably still the single most important driver of the global economy. The EU is the largest customer of the EU. I've already mentioned the sizable footprint of German companies in North Carolina. It's true for the US in its entirety too. Many of you know this firsthand. 
And when I travel in the United States, people often tell me how much they appreciate German trade and investment uh, made by German companies. Yet in Washington, it tends to be a different narrative. There, tariffs on imported cars are seriously being considered. The justification offered is they are a threat to national security. These tariffs are hanging over the talks like a sword of Damocles. Now, setting the justification aside, one thing is, is certain. Tariffs would hurt business on both sides of the Atlantic, and not only in the long run, but in most cases, immediately. They're far more likely to turn out as obstacles for future economic cooperation, certainly not facilitators. Right now, negotiations on a positive trade agenda are ongoing. EU Trade Commissioner Maelstrom was in Washington just this week. And we support these talks because no one benefits from the confrontation. I would hope that the US and Europe should stand, set standards for trade in the 21st century. And I can only turn to you. A positive message on trade is most powerful when it comes from those who directly benefit from it and who carry the responsibility for creating and holding down jobs. Help us spread that message. There's a second point that worries me. Some of the disputes uh, that we have reflect internal debates that we have in Germany and you have in the US. There's an internal uh, debate on trade in the US. There's an internal debate on burden sharing in Germany, on migration. Conflicting views in this country reflect um, divisions in mine, with very similar arguments, by the way. I worry about that, and I certainly try to stay clear of that, because this has the potential to fuel exasperation at a time and in a context where this is anything but in our shared interest. Why? If we look around us, we see the international geopolitical and strategic landscape changing. The rise of China happens at a pace unprecedented in history. In a few years only, China's economy will be the largest in the world. In PPP terms, it has overtaken the US already. On a global scale, we see China accumulating overwhelming advantages that it will use and is using to encourage or coerce cooperation unencumbered by any serious requirement to rationalize behavior in terms of international law or norms. Russia's return as a military power using the digital means of asymmetric warfare for geopolitical gains is another strategic challenger. And ISIS. While ISIS may largely have been beaten and certainly lost the radicalizing inspiration of forced Islamists all over the world associated with its advance in Syria and Iraq, the assumption is in place that Islamist militancy will remain a threat. There's simply too many people, and I say that from previous experience, uh, too many people speaking the violent, anti-Western, and hateful language of Islamist militancy steeped in a subculture of extremism. In our hyper-connected, open communication societies, this can mean instant contagion for our countries, the terrorist attacks that occurred in Europe between 2015 and 2017 are a stark reminder of that. All that, that is the changing environment we live in. And it's a paradox that while we are aligned in confronting these threats, in seeing them and analyzing them, they will also inevitably alter our relationship. These monumental strategic challenges will shift the US focus. It will have to. And as that happens, European countries and the European Union will have to take on more responsibility for their own security. That is in our shared interest too. 
You will want your allies to be strong. And we want our allies to be strong. But it's a change that we need to accept, yes, embrace. It would happen under any circumstances and in other domestic constellations as well. But we should not embrace it by targeting each other. In the US, I feel there's a growing sense for some people have called the virtue of nationalism or sovereignism, sovereign states, if you like. For Europeans that have, under American leadership and with enormous visionary American thinking and political support over the past 70 years, for Europeans, the word nationalism carries an ominous ring. Now, if Americans take a dim view of the state of affairs in Europe, well, many Europeans would agree. But it is an entirely different matter to challenge or to refute the strategic relevance or desirability of European integration. This latter would open a, a wide divide in a context that is existential for Europeans. And isn't the question in place too whether dissent over and disregard for the strategic purpose of the European Union would weaken us with respect to both threats and strategic competitors? Wouldn't they carefully note, take note of this rift and maximize it for purposes of their own and against our shared interests. If I hear American friends saying we had best compartmentalize our bilateral cooperation as if we could surgically uh, remove um, or separate this from uh, the areas of um, disagreement, well, I'm tempted to think that there will be plenty of actors around the globe that will make sure that this will not work. But there are different ways to, or different gauges to assess a relationship. You can look through a magnifying glass, and what you will see will be the specific dossiers and issues, uh, or more generally questions that diplomacy will have to tackle. It is what I did in my first observations. If you take the panorama lens, you will see the environment and the larger context. The second segment of my observations did that. And there's a third way. It's the X-ray. If you apply the X-ray, this is what you're going to see. 10,000 Germans studying in the US last year and vice versa. Nearly 700,000 well-paid, skilled jobs in the US, uh, created and managed by German companies in the United States. Roughly 50 million Americans of German descent. Countless exchange programs run by schools, universities, cities. Over 200 cities connected by sister city partnerships. Much of this is not government sponsored, but privately driven. There are uncounted interactions by institutions, companies, families. American and German armed forces serving side by side in different regions of the world. German-owned German affiliates is spending more than $6 billion annually for research and development in the United States. 17 million American servicemen having done a turn of duty, or several ones in Germany, since World War II. There are 35,000 deployed right uh, there right now, albeit down from 250,000 back in 1985. Now, this is a completely random list, and as such, incomplete. What I want to say is, there is, simply put, so much interaction, there's so, much, so many mutual influences in the history of our relationship, and many of them may have been purely personal and perhaps even long forgotten, but they have visibly or invisibly 
contributed to the bilateral DNA, even if we are not particularly conscious of them. The result is a tightly knit fabric of bonds and links that cover all areas of any relationship, politics and trade, science, culture, personal bonds. Many of these ties and interactions are remote from politics. And this will not go away or evaporate because we disagree on how to handle Iran or because of Nord Stream. This large part of our relationship is ring-fenced from short-term developments, and it makes our relationship resilient. It is against this backdrop that we launched Wunderbar Together, which is a year-long cultural program to invest in the German-American friendship. It includes over 1,000 events across all states. We want to bring Germans and Americans together. A number of projects will take place here in Charlotte. For example, the World Affairs Council of America and the American Council on Germany will jumpstart a grassroots dialogue within their communities to discuss what today's Germany means to the US. I personally see the Deutschland Jahr as a year-long space for reappraisal, ascertainment, for understanding why and how we have identical or different angles, identical or different expectations, identical or different experiences, and why all of that is important. I hope that many of you will actively participate in that campaign. It's about Germans and Americans, about Americans and Germans. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Haber. That was a fascinating discussion on German-American relations, and you talked about what holds us together is more important than some of our differences. Good afternoon. I'm Rena Arline. I am um, uh, on the World Affairs Board, and I am very excited to be here to help facilitate the question and answer session. Um, and so what we would like to do is we'd love to start off with the students, and uh, if you can keep your questions short and succinct. We'll have Ambassador Haber get to as many questions as we possibly can. So I know we've got Stefan and we've got Jesse. Where's Jesse? So we've got microphones. So um, if we can start off with the students, I can see, uh, yes, the gentleman right there in the middle. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, so national identity in the in U.S. and in Germany has been changing in really important ways these past few years. And I was wondering how you think that um, these changes will affect the way that Germany and the U.S. together will interact with the world around them. Um, I'd say that national identity in Europe and in European states and national identity in the US uh, are very separate uh, uh, concepts. Now, if I look at my own country, uh, it has changed enormously. Just look at the uh, upheavals uh, the country has witnessed uh, ever since reunification, that Eastern Germany has uh, witnessed that Germany has witnessed with the great migration uh, from the Balkans uh, in the 90s, the changes Germany has witnessed uh, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the wake uh, of the migration uh, between 2015 and 16, all of, that, all of that changes a society. It's always a risk because uh, change is not that easily embraced, especially if people are worried about their future. And if they ask the question what it means for them, for their life, uh, for, um, uh, for their environment, for their children. Um, I do not specifically see a transatlantic, uh, uh, um, um, a transatlantic challenge there. It's things that happen. And they happen more fast in our interconnected world uh, with borders, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in our hyperconnected a world where we simply are so directly connected that everything that's happening here has an instant impact or possibly an instant response in Europe. Um, so it, don't, don't view it through the prism uh, of a rift or even a widening rift. Uh, it's, um, 
it's um, a discussion, um, sometimes a controversy, uh, sometimes uh, um, uh, simply a development that affects us uh, uh, in a way that intrinsically also links us. Stefan, any other students? Sind USA und Deutschland involviert in irgendwelchen wirtschaftlichen um, Besierungen in Charlotte? Oh, <laughs> in Thank Charlotte. You. For people that don't know German, are the U.S. <laughs> are the U.S. and Germany involved in any joint ventures in Charlotte? Oh yes. Uh, <laughs> um, and you, you, you would have to take a lot, a lot of time uh, if I were to enumerate them. I think we can say uh, that uh, American-German cooperation in Charlotte uh, is a joint venture. And thank you very much for your kind words of welcome. Let's go to this side of the house. Anybody? No? Nope. Right there. Um, thank you for coming. So what do you find unique about the perspectives that you've gained from working in the realm of international relations and foreign policy? What I find unique here in the United States or generally? Um, about the perspective that you've gained like just between like the United States in general. What I find fascinating is uh, I like to understand things. I like to see the patterns of things. Uh, I like to um, handle disputes or even only different views in a way uh, that will widen um, consensus. Uh, I simply love to deal with people. <laughs> I love to discuss. I love to understand where other people come from and why, and why that's important for us. And that's my job every day. That's what I find fascinating. Gibt es eine besondere Einstellung zu der Zeit, derzeitigen Einwandererpolitik? Um, I was asked uh, about my, um, migration and uh, are you speaking about migration into Europe or migration generally? Generally. Migration happens. <laughs> it happens all the time. Sometimes um, um, when I hear uh, that allegedly Chancellor Merkel had opened the borders in 2015, I like to reply uh, that she didn't because we had open borders all along. And actually, when she decided on controls, uh, she had to request permission by the European Commission to do that, uh, uh, just that. Migration happens for basically three re uh, reasons. The first one is people usually have very good reasons uh, to leave the country uh, of origin. The second uh, is they usually um, uh, have good reasons to choose a destination. That might not qualify for asylum or protection, but the reasons are there all the same. And thirdly, they come because they can. And if you want to tackle migration, and I agree, it has to be tackled because the uh, cohesion of a society uh, is not endless. Um, and you'll have to f find a middle path uh, that will secure cohesion of the society in the sense of solidarity that one part of the society has for the rest of the society, right? But at the same time, uh, um, you'll have to take into account uh, that if you do not tackle the three other areas that I've mentioned, uh, migration will continue uh, 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 to, to take place. And may I just add, um, I said it in, uh, in my, um, uh, in my short speech before, we have um, a discussion on migration in Europe. It very much resembles the discussion here. Um, in not all, but nearly all the European countries, 
because migration is a huge challenge, it can alter a society. And uh, if a society uh, changes, which they do all the time, all the time, but all parts and segments of the society, in a democracy at least, uh, will have to accept that uh, and will have to uh, will have to be explained to why this happens uh, and why the risks uh, do not um, uh, outweigh the, uh, um, the opportunities. Jesse, you've got one in the back. Hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Claire Brantley, I'm with Davidson College. Uh, to continue the theme on a political level, should we anticipate a dialogue shift away from migration as the key issue? identity issue and political discourse after the 2020 United States election within Germany? Or do we anticipate something along the lines of border security, globalization, NATO-EU relations, sustaining salience as politically divisive and determinative topics? Thank you. The numbers on um, migration into Europe uh, are down. They are, have been going down uh, ever since the 4th of, uh, 4th of April 2016. It was the moment when uh, different parts uh, of the migration um, uh, policy of the European Union and of my country uh, sort of fell into place. The Turkey Agreement, the uh, improvement of uh, conditions uh, for refugees in Turkey, Turkey being ready uh, to uh, re-welcome them, uh, while in return uh, being uh, uh, on the receiving end of huge invest, uh, investment into their recep uh, reception facilities. Um, it included changes of law in the European level. It included changes of law uh, in, uh, on the German uh, level, uh, which altered the incentives uh, uh, for people who, there were those too who just came uh, to Germany because uh, uh, um, social benefits were one of the uh, um, motivating factors. This was by far not, there were not all, but it was one of the, uh, uh, one of the aspects. Um, ever since, numbers um, are low. No one disputes that. Um, but yet, uh, um, migration has been um, a key factor fueling uh, political discourse in Germany, even though the numbers are small. Uh, um, are so uh, uh, small nowadays. It is because uh, um, a huge segment of uh, the society in my country felt this was a massive change, um, and they turned to elected politicians and said, uh, um, we, we didn't get to decide about it. <laughs> As I explained to you before, migration happens unless you tackle all the three elements why it happens. Uh, um, but there was this disconnect. Uh, and it's difficult in such a situation to explain to people uh, that in um, our connected world, uh, um, the space for sovereign decision uh, has actually shrunk. It has shrunk because of international law, because of European law, because of integration. In a democracy, which is um, uh, which defines itself uh, within certain borders, that's a difficult argument to make. So to your question, do you expect that this topic will go away? Um, I think it will lose, uh, um, it, it will lose some of its gravity, um, but it will remain um, a major topic for some years to come, simply because the uh, experience uh, had, had loomed so large. Mm. Thanks, students. Those are great questions. Do we have any other questions from the audience? John? Once upon a time, there was a transatlantic tr trans trade and investment partnership that was being discussed. Um, people from the Charlotte region led by Tony Zeiss and Michael Almond uh, brought us into uh, contact with, group, with a group of business leaders from Germany to expand that opportunity. Um, can you give us any update? Uh, some of us would like to see more of those partnerships take place and renew some of that activity. Uh, is, do you see any promise for that uh, in the near future? If the interest is there, uh, um, 
if the interest is there and if it's driven by the interest of businesses and industries, I see great prospects. But you need to understand it will happen in a context that is difficult for me to predict today. I don't know what will happen in February. I don't know whether tariffs on cars will be decided on. I don't know how the, uh, I cannot precisely say how uh, the negotiations uh, will evolve. Uh, obviously, uh, anything you do will have a huge impact, or you do and you ask, will, um, no, will help to co-define the context. So I can only encourage uh, um, all of you and all of us, uh, um, make your voice heard. Say what's in your interest. Say why that is the case. Uh, it will perhaps help uh, to refocus, uh, refocus a dispute uh, on actually uh, the areas where we have shared interest. And I should say shared interest means well-paid jobs, many of them, um, uh, 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 prospects for businesses to come to the region. They don't do that. Uh, that's not a charity. They do it because it's their interest. I'm not surprised there's so many businesses here in uh, Charlotte and uh, North Carolina. It's because the environment uh, uh, is attractive and interesting to these businesses. It's a two-way street, if you like. Uh, and that needs to be understood. Let's take one more question. Um, yes, the gentleman right there. Thank you so much, Madam Ambassador. Uh, you talked about a global view of things um, among your pr uh, perspectives, which was great. I have a question for you. I think we share, as as a, in in the uh, among the the folks, we I think we we share a common bewilderment uh, in the United States, in Great Britain, and in Europe, and that is how do you define democracy within a world in which bureaucrats have created so many laws and even the prime minister of Germany has to ask permission from, a, from Belgium, from uh, Brussels, to be able to do things for its own country. This is bewildering British, Americans, and I think European people as well. Um, that's one narrative I hear often. And it's usually um, compounded uh, by the argument uh, that the European Union, uh, that the European institutions were not um, democratically, uh, um, uh, had no uh, democratic legitimacy. I don't think that's right. First of all, uh, we have elections in all European states. European um, uh, uh, decisions on um, Europe or on transferring sovereignty to European institutions for the sake of a more coherent uh, uh, position of the European Union are taken by governments and heads of governments that have been elected by the people. So there's no uh, uh, undemocratic disconnect as many here uh, contend. Uh, why are we in Europe interested not all are, the British are, uh, are leaving the European Union. Actually, they're having a very painful de debate on that. I don't know what the, uh, uh, the vote tonight, uh, um, uh, if the vote has been taken as yet. But they had a painful uh, debate. Other Europeans have taken an, uh, a different uh, uh, course. They have decided uh, that they will profit from transfer, uh, transferring sovereignty uh, to European institution, and that is, I return to the context I've mentioned before. The world is changing. The uh, rules and regulations and the acquis that has been largely um, um, that has been largely influenced by the Western world under American leadership uh, over the past 70 years uh, are being attacked uh, uh, by either new actors or by those actors that had not been on the international arena uh, these 70 years ago. Uh, and. Frankly, uh, by attack, I mean attack the way we want to live. You want to live, my country wants to live, other European countries want to live. And if we want to decide uh, or um, if we want to have a say um, in how the rules of the future um, will play out, well, then we need the collective clout 
of all European states, or at least as many as we possibly can, because a continent of soon 450,000, uh, uh, 450 uh, a million people, um, uh, with uh, I think 20% of the world production, 30% of uh, world exports, will have a much greater cloud uh, than individual European states. That's what you call asymmetric power. And that's why we are interested uh, um, in the concept of sharing uh, of sovereignty. We see what's in for us. You take a different course. You are in a different, uh, uh, um, uh, you're in a completely different situation. You are a huge country, the most powerful in the world, uh, uh, and still uh, the largest uh, economy. But even for the United States, I never tell anyone <laughs> what should be in their interest. But in this case, permit me to say, uh, I feel it difficult to understand why alliances um, seem to become a concept here that will harm and not help American power. I feel that American power in the past was not least based on the fact that you had, I think, 69 allies. 69 alliances for the most powerful country in the world. To have the shadow of 69 alliances means leverage of power. And that's how I would view today. Look at the European Union not only as a project uh, that would cover shared values, which many put at the forefront, look at it also uh, as a project that is to secure, leverage um, our power um, with regard to those that attack it, um, politically, uh, I mean, uh, and as a way to ascertain, ascertain the way we want to live. Thank you, Ambassador. That was great. I'm going to invite... <laughs> So we're going to invite Wayne Cooper, who is the chairman of our board of um, World Affairs Council, to close us out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Madam Ambassador, we thank you so much on behalf of the board of directors of the World Affairs Council. We want to present this small oh, token of our appreciation. Oh, it will, uh, it will retain a place of honor in my office in Washington. So when you visit me, uh, um, I'll bring you to the picture. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you.